All right, well, Cinema 4D 2024 was released today. I just got done watching the main release video as well as kind of going through a lot of the new features and improvements, and so I wanted to take you through them. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's go over some of these new features. Let's start with the viewport playback speed and redshift integration into the viewport. Starting with 2024, if I play back this scene where I have some soft body toruses dropping onto this plane with the displacer, you can see I'm roughly getting seven, almost eight frames per second. Okay, now it was a little bit higher uh, before I started recording, but I suspect doing that at the same time is costing me a little bit of performance. And if we switch to that same scene in 2023, uh, we'll see that it's a little bit lower, right? Almost like a frame, frame per second slower. So not quite the, um, you know, two times performance they were mentioning. Uh, I should also mention that the simulation is cached, so it's not having to do that. It's just trying to play it back. Um, and I do have these objects uh, in subdivision surfaces to, you know, try and increase the polygon count and make Cinema 4D work harder. So wasn't quite seeing that, but what I was pleasantly surprised with was the um, redshift integration into the perspective view. So if I toggle back on those materials in 2023, notice how all we get are solid colors. Um, you know, we do see some of our maps being shown here uh, with some invisible lighting, kind of the default lighting, but this is pretty much what we get. And just for reference, these are the, the three materials, three different capsules I grabbed, and you'll notice that, yeah, not even the um, color here is showing up. If we compare that to 2024, you will see um, that we now get those colors in a little bit more detail as well. Now, um, I can add a light here, and I, I really can't comment to in terms of how this light uh, if it looks any different, seems like it's not blowing things out quite as much. Um, but yeah, if we turn up the illumination adjustment, you know, we can see things a little bit more there. Keeping in mind that the illumination adjustment is just for the perspective view, not for the render. And we can see, yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, and if I was to actually render this, um, we can see, well, there it was, but this is kind of what we get. And so I almost have to turn up that illumination adjustment to uh, be a bit closer uh, to what I have rendered. Now, I wouldn't trust what I see in the perspective view anyway. I typically take that to zero, but it's nice that um, the materials uh, and lighting are starting to look a little bit better without us having to render. Though that being said, um, you know, rendering is going to give us uh, the best idea of what our projects look like. And I would never trust what the uh, viewport looks like, but I certainly like having these colors. So that way I don't have to start rendering just to kind of see um, what we have here. Another improvement or several improvements uh, that they had were in Pyro. Uh, now I don't use Pyro too much myself. Uh, it is something that um, I do enjoy playing around with, but uh, you know, day to day, it's not something I use all that often. Um, and they added the ability to add pyro to particles, or um, in this case, the emitter. And so all I did was add our particle, or I'm sorry, our pyro tag um, to the emitter. I also just changed the color just for fun. And so now when I hit play, we will see um, pyro being added to this. So I think that's a nice cool addition, especially because with this, um, you know, you can use the field force and really um, do some interesting things. I think they also mentioned that uh, Pyro now works on the uh, matrix object. So if you use that a bunch, um, that could be helpful as well. Um, a couple other things I thought were interesting that were new that I didn't see them touch on was this emission fall off and emission map. That's definitely something I, I plan to dive into a bit more and perhaps make a video about if it um, uh, ends up being kind of cool. Uh, and then there were some other options in the pyro output uh, where one, you could uh, have multiple caches and switch bet between them, um, whether you were testing something out or uh, because you up a simulation, which is um, something that they added as well. So uh, what's nice is it seems like they kind of lowered the playback quality or the viewport quality a bit, but they made it easier to up it and get um, the quality you want. So whether uh, you know, you just want to work low res and then make sure the, the high res one looks 
looks good. Um, you can do that without having to kind of go back and forth and work with that one um, quite as much. Uh, you will still have to do a little bit of that though, um, perhaps, and some additional um, options there. Uh, I find it interesting. There's fields here. Um, once again, that's something I would be very curious to double check to make sure it works the way I think it might, um, where in theory, I guess that's maybe just the noise fall off um, instead of for the whole up res, but I thought it would be interesting if it did work for the up res, uh, which is, uh, I thought was strange. So it does appear to just be for that noise, which could be um, interesting, especially because they're giving you additional options to control this instead of just directly up resing it. Probably the biggest one, um, biggest feature that I thought was, was not Redshift um, was that they added um, rigid bodies to the rest of the simulation tool. So uh, if you've spent any time in Cinema 4D uh, doing simulations, um, you'll know that for a while now, ever since they added the, what they were calling the unified simulation stuff, uh, even though it wasn't, um, our rigid body tags were separated into the bullet tags. Um, and in the simulation options, we had pretty much everything else from cloth to soft bodies to rope, uh, as well as pyro. Well, now they have rigid body in here and it works just like um, the previous one. Um, now I haven't compared the settings too much and dived uh, terribly deep into it, but you know we have our rigid body, we have our collider. Where did it go? Where did, there it is. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, two out of the really three um, rigid body tags. Soft body, obviously, while you could use, uh, I would recommend using the newer version um, in the simulation um, tags now. And so really, unless it's an old project, we can almost, you know, forget about using bullet tags. And unless the project was super detailed, you know, um, maybe even change it over to the, the newer simulation system. Um, and all I have here is a cube where I have added the rigid body tag and um, a plane where I added cloth uh, with an initial state. So that way it kind of starts down like this. And so, yeah, nothing crazy, but now we have both of these systems interacting and working um, together the way they should. Previously, it was possible to kind of fake it with the cloth tag on it if you adjusted the, the stiffness settings and whatnot so your like cube here wouldn't deform, um, but it's nice now that it's all into one. Honestly, I was a bit disappointed there wasn't more with this. I mean, this you know was pretty expected. I would have liked to have seen fluid, so perhaps that's another year out or it'll be in the half update or whatever they do, but that's kind of uh, where I'm hoping they uh, would go with this. Um, Speaking of Redshift, there were a couple of uh, things worth mentioning in here. The biggest one, um, and it's not even that big of a change if, if that means anything, uh, is that they changed the default renderer to Redshift, um, which may seem like a minor thing, and honestly it is, but it is quite nice that I don't have to change it in all my scenes or I don't have to set up a template file where that's been done for me. I should also mention this Redshift menu, which has been here for a while, maybe you didn't know it, does have the ability to kind of get all of our different um, Redshift windows and, and whatnot here. Um, you can also pull up the preferences because I think previously this Redshift menu wasn't exposed. And so if you don't want that exposed, um, then you can just turn off um, the Redshift, you know, in the main menu. But I do like that they finally did this. I do think it makes things quite a bit easier, more streamlined, um, and hopefully it gets more people using Redshift, which uh, I don't think is a bad thing. Now, um, some other things they mentioned that had come out previously is there are now quite a few Redshift materials um, in here, as well as other capsules uh, that they've been adding. Um, so I think they've added a bunch of fabric ones, trees, I guess going under models would help, but you can you know see all these um, plants and, and bushes and shrubs and whatnot. So I think it's great they're there. I wish these cars would be Redshift. And I always think kind of getting free stuff is nice, especially whether it's models like that or the materials, fabric and plastics and, and, and what have you. Um, definitely save some time. Um, but like I said, those aren't terribly new. The other thing that um, they mentioned, and, and once again, it's been out for a little while and I've uh, we'll probably make a video about this at some point, is the jitter node. Uh, now the jitter node is another way um, you can make MoGraph objects have different colors or even just non-MoGraph objects as well. 
So if I start my IPR here, you'll notice that I do have some variation um, in the color, and that's all being done in the um, jitter node. And, and I'm not gonna go too much into it, but you can decide how uh, it's going to break up the color, whether it's by names, object IDs, or user data. And then, yeah, choose you know a starting color if you want, right? Notice how it does impact how much variation we get, at least by default. So find your color. Now, maybe you want like a blue, although I think something a little bit darker is gonna be easier to see. So maybe we'll go with that yellow. And then different controls for the amount of hue variation you would like, right? So you can go completely random, change the seed, work with the saturation. If you want more saturated, less saturated. Uh, not unlike some of the other ways we can control MoGraph color previously, um, but I think we have a little bit more control here. And like I said, this also works uh, on things that aren't MoGraph using these other input node, uh, modes. So that's really um, nice, as well as some other things we can add jitter to, which can be helpful is um, I'll show in a later video. Uh, the last one, um, last thing I wanted to talk about was the projection deformer. Now, what I have here is a tube that I've kind of flattened out, right? And I've just added a black material to it to make it a little bit easier to see, okay? And, you know, if you wanted to take this and, and kind of project it onto the surface here, um, that can be a bit tricky. Now, there's been other ways of doing this, um, other deformers that were perhaps a little bit harder to work with. Um, it wasn't collision. A uh, wrap deformer, you could also do something similar with splines. Um, but yeah, geometry to geometry, it was always challenging. And while this still can be, depending on exactly what you want to do, if you're trying to do something relatively simple, the projection deformer here um, can help. So um, I created it, I made it a child of the tube, just like you would any other deformer. Um, actually, why don't I just start from scratch here? So get my projection deformer, make it a child of the tube. Uh, you can see it does have some arrows indicating which way it's going to project. Um, and you can adjust that in the orientation here. So you can see it's going X, Y, um, I want Z. And in fact, I want positive Z. Right, pointing in the same direction as that arrow. Um, tell it what object I want to project onto. And there you go. If I hide the sphere, you can see it's there. Um, you can offset it a bit, right? One centimeter, work with the strength. And this also has the ability to use fields. So if I wanted to control the strength this way, um, I absolutely could, All right? Not that I suspect well, it's kind of like a contact being applied to an eye or something, so not the worst thing ever, all right? But I thought that was really neat, something worthwhile, um, finally. Because, yeah, it can be hard to get geometry to lay flat on to a surface. Um, and those were the biggest um, additions to Cinema 4D 2024. Honestly, perhaps a bit underwhelming, although I do think there, there are some, some useful things going on and I didn't cover everything. Uh, so please go watch the full video as there were some other modeling improvements, um, with like the modeling brush and the fong tag that, uh, I guess could be useful, but, um, I didn't see a, a very important use case that, uh, I thought was, was worth talking about, but that will do it for this video. If there's anything else you would like to see, please leave me a comment down below. And if you enjoyed it, if you could do me a favor, like the video as well as subscribe to my channel, I'd appreciate it. And until next time, take care.